you might have seen a number of his works um, with uh, many small characters uh, holding hands, creating a sort of thread, human thread, another important idea also for Lila. Um, but also you must have seen the other types of works that he has done, which are huge, big bodies thrown in the air and uh, holding the ground on a very small spot. And he has managed to do this with drones. At the same time, something extremely heavy, hard to carry on, on, our, on one's own. And at the same time, a lot of lightness. Um, on the side, he has also expressed a number of uh, important views on the state of uh, arts in India and how um, the state and institutions welcome the works of artists like him um, to show their works in uh, public spaces. Um, and I think um, we'll get a chance to hear about this a little bit tonight also. Um, briefly, the history of K. S. Radhakrishnan. He's a native of Kottayam in Kerala. Uh, he studied in Santiniketan in West Bengal. And um, soon after his studies, he could start um, presenting his work. Um, and now you, he has organized a number of shows on his own with different groups um, in the Kala Academy in Delhi, at the Biala Academy of Arts and Culture in Calcutta, in Vadodara, also in several places in France and over the world. Um, he has created the exhibition a few years back, uh, Ramkinkar Baiji uh, Retrospective at the National Gallery of Modern Arts here in Delhi, and then in Bangalore and Mumbai. He was awarded with the KCS Panikar Puraskar Award in uh, Kerala in 2011. And uh, he is the um, author of the exhibition Liminal Figures, Liminal Space, in 2010 in Mumbai. And more recently in Dhaka, another exhibition called um, Conflict Within Descending, uh, sorry, Ascending Descending Figures. I'll give the mic to Rizio for the introduction of the evening. And uh, I hope everybody will enjoy this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> I must actually start with a story of continuity because uh, Ratha is a very close friend and uh, we have a common kind of space that we share. We come from the same college, um, we study at the same college. So the first time I met Ratha was uh, at my college when I was a student. He'd come there to kind of make a presentation like this. Uh, he was invited uh, by the alumni association there uh, and the college uh, because he is an alumnus and he came and presented this. This was many years back. Uh, and uh, I remember this evening and we, we fondly remember it like whenever we meet, etc. Even now, uh, like after this presentation, I, I remember the two of us walking uh, in, in, in the campus and talking about his works. And uh, I remember one one thing that I said to him that day. I said, looking at his works, you know, various things which he presented, I said, it looks like a continuing statement. Uh, this is what I said, I clearly, vividly remember telling him this. And uh, after almost two decades, uh, I was sitting here uh, and actually hosting uh, uh, a lecture titled Bronze is Continuity in a series called Cultures is Continuum is uh, uh, one thing a serendipitous thing, another is a very personally happy thing for me. You know, this kind of, there's a play in this, many of these things which happen at Leela is uh, indeed a very happy play. So I'm very happy that uh, Radha is sitting beside me today and uh, this and after that, there's a long gap, and I met him in Delhi years later. 
and uh, then we, we shared this moment, etc. Uh, I, I, I must also tell you as a brief introduction as to how this lecture came to be part of the series. Uh, uh, bronze uh, as a material has always been very intriguing because uh, this is one, when we think about continuities, you go back and think about things which, which have come to us from a long time back. So bronze is one of the most ancient uh, metals that if, uh, we have the bronze age. So, uh, so the, uh, the, the question that intrigued us is this, uh, how is a material which is so solid, how does it become uh, so many things, you know, how does it yield itself to, to kind of so many forms? Uh, how, how is it fle this flexibility possible, even as there is an apparent uh, solidity, there is a kind of inflexibility about that? This was one question. And when you look at the history of bronze, then you find like how this metal has got into various spaces creating a certain kind of continuity and uh, how it becomes and then to look at Rafa who has actually only been working with this material. This is very, this really kind of engaged us because in these times when you have a lot of things around, you know, when you talk about a visual artist, there are a lot of media that you can work with. So how it it engaged us that one person uh, kind of stuck to one medium. So there has to be some, some kind of a deep bond with uh, this particular material. So that is uh, very important for us when we're thinking about something like continuity. You know, you're, you're living in an age when you're fed up of everything so fast, you know, fed up of relationships, fed up of your medium, fed up of your courses, fed up of every single thing. And then how does, uh, it, it becomes so important for us to arrive at people and engage with people who have been having long relationships with material, spaces, etc. Uh, another thing about uh, Ratha's work, if you, you must have seen a lot of his work because it's all over, uh, is the scale, you know, the, the possibility of scale that he, the variety that he achieves in terms of scale, like from a seedling, uh, that small uh, thing, to large, larger than life uh, figures, you know, going into the horizon, that kind of figures, it is, it's huge, like, you know, the range is so, so vast. So how, uh, it, this is engaging, like, so when you say this, from this to this, it is also the kind of engagement with the in-between spaces. So then you suddenly realize that it, one, one lifetime is not enough for you to actually engage with one material vis-a-vis -vis the, the world that, that, that is around us. And another thing that engaged us is very different from other sculptors, Nata has two characters who get into different spaces and become uh, different objects, different, you know, they, they, they take different forms, which is also a certain kind of uh, continuity, like it is not as though, you know, this character can only this become this, it can become anything, it can get into any spaces. So again, characters made in bronze, and they can enter any space as though they are they are they are material. They can enter any space and create a narrative. These are different things which uh, engaged us, intrigued us about Ratha's world. I would uh, request him to begin his presentation, and then we can have a conversation. I'm sure this evening would yield I mean, result in a very good conversation because these are some possibilities that we see in the space that he is handling and we should uh, really deeply, profoundly engage with this space. I will come back.
since you had sort of spoken about uh, why one is working for so many years, the best answer is that of course she already said the answer in itself that I'm not fed up of this material. And uh, I don't see any chances of also in the near future because I took to bronze, I mean, as a student. And uh, also she was sort of posing one of the things, why is that that I'm working? Of course, not really just tired of, tired of, I'm not tired of it, but also I don't know anything else. And that's probably the right because I just, 40 years back, when I went to Shantani Kedan as a student, uh, there were two masters. And both the sculptors, they were working on this medium. Or wanting to do, like, this image that I started with is the treated crucible here. And I think the first casting was made in 74. Because those days, you know, as students, you had no scope to work on your own sculptures. It was it's very expensive medium. So you had to naturally work with your teacher because their castings are going on. So you are really getting to like ranking their page. <clears throat> he wanted to have some of his sculptures cast into bronze. It was impossible for a professor unless it's commissioned. And some of the large sculptures in Chandigarh that we see in concrete which are later, much later, this are last when I kept them. But I remember casting one of the sculptures which is still placed here, here in Ravindra Bhavan, Ravindra Bhavan, when you enter, you have a, a bust of Tago. That was cast the same year, 1974. And that was the first expo. We all had the chance to work that. A, a portrait bust is so big that time for us to have a so that scale. And the other teacher that I had was Shargura Vajjami. So I'm showing this was this Ramkinger page. This was the way I met him when I went to Shantani Not that he's always angry like that. <laughs> uh, but because it's a, it's one of the powerful, because you know it shows the strength of the person, the, the kind of involvement, because this is my I was talking to you about the other teacher, Shadabri Roy Chaudhary, the other sculptor. Shadabri Roy Chaudhary fixed the camera while Ramkinger was working. And he fixed the camera and pulled Ramkinder from behind. And he just turned back and he clicked the photograph. And Shankari, in fact, replaced Ramkinder after Kinderula retired as a professor. Though Ramkinder used to come and work in the faculty in the house. So, Sharparida, Sharparida Chaudhary, but I call Sharparida, I'm using the same thing. Sharparida was working on small scale sculptures, very, very. Uh, Chinese sculptures, and the biggest size that he made those days were like a portrait, a life size portrait or something like that. Wow. This is the bust that I was talking to in Gertrude Academy, and this is the bust that was, that was done in 1939. This piece, and the bronze of it is kept in Gertrude. Uh, and the next one is the Shakuraloi Chaudhary. Uh, it's the portrait of Bedegula Mani, and he made most of the musicians' portraits. So, so I was very closely working with these two masters. So I just wanted to show how the, the scale of this work and the bronze was impossible. So I don't know when did I start working on my own bronze. Probably after spending three years, or someday what I used to do is that when these masters, when they are casting a bronze, I used to make a small, without even their knowledge, they used to put in the clean. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, when after the casting, they said, well, I had only five mold. What is the sixth, sixth one is coming from? Mm -hmm. So, and that was the way I, we all, all the, we used to make sort of, you know, in, engaging ourselves with our own experiments and things like that. Next. So, uh, this tilted bronze uh, took to pour the metal, molten mold, metal into the mold, you know. Because when one talking about working on bronze, you don't work directly with bronze. It's always that you have a, an investment modeling in clay or plaster paris or whatever, and then you have a, you know, uh, the mold prepared specially for, especially the work has to be done in wax. 
So the lost crunch technique, that's what was prevailed and there's no other thing, there's no other option. The only casting is lost wax. But there are other suppress castings which are for the solid castings. But this image is, this that is made as a kind of a, what you call it, spade of the urgency of the metal that is ready pouring into a mold. But at the same time, it's being also connected to the, the head of a coffin, the demon. So here, the Mahishasuri and the flow of the, I mean, don't call it blood, but I call it the, the tongue that comes out of the buffalo. And uh, at the same time, it's a crucible, crucible at the mountain metal. So I'm just connecting it because pouring, a, pouring metal into a mold is an act of creation here. And so the sustainability of, you know, that uh, the creation, that act of that is what is this image. And uh, this work was done. Um, uh, well, I just did it specially for this uh, evening because it was not shown anywhere. It's recently done for giving it to Leela Foundation that has done a lot of work in this field. And also, when we really talked about bronze as continuity, it was, this was what has come to me, not in the speak about it. But as an image, when it came to me, I thought I would start working on it. So, I would like to, yeah, open this, maybe, you know, somebody could come and open this up too. I had worked on the same thing, this molten bronze on a milestone and uh, this series of sculptures that connected to the sort of concept of this continuity in, in the mold of the floor. And uh, uh, I don't have them with me, so I don't various collections, but this, um, this, this image is so strongly registered that, you know, and I remember that uh, uh, sometimes it, it really makes you feel in that because you are involved so much with the casting process, the technical process, you know, because these days you get it cut, get casted by others in the foundry and all, but those days we are doing it ourselves. So the next. <coughs> and uh, this idea of this Vaishasur, the demon, that came from this, uh, the, from this the Durga festivals that we used to have in Calcutta. And since I spent a lot of uh, many years in Shamani Kedan and <coughs> on Calcutta, so this Durga festival that, and also this is one of the sculptures that I am showing of a, a, a Durga, which is which is done for one of the Pandas. In Calcutta, this Gokul Gala, this one place, that had always sculptures made by sculptors, but not by in the, the traditional makers, angle makers. So they had asked actually, because we were students, they had asked Shagar Roy Chaudhary to make this piece. 
to Durga for that particular year and that and, and to that time probably he had high temperature or whatever reason and it had there is a deadline, it had to be submitted. Then I was told that would you make it? And that was the reason I had this opportunity to make. Uh, Durga, taking the reference strongly from the traditional uh, Odisha, this, you know, this uh, uh, Ashtabhuj sculpture from the Odisha image. So I used to sort of try a lot looking at the traditional Indian and interpreting in a, in a, in a contemporary way. So this is, after completing the sculpture, it was the performance of the Puja. They have not, uh, uh, you know, yes, they haven't invested into river or whatever, they have kept it in the museum. So it's still in the Calcutta Museum, if one can see that. And I enjoy working on this next. Yeah, and also sort of talking about, you know, the whole concept of this bronze that we are talking about. See, we have these age-old sculptures. I mean, it's like uh, the same technique of casting in bronze and, you know, this is 3000 BC or and uh, Mohanjadaro happened to come to this uh, civilization, this sculpture, the uh, dancing girl. So I, I was so strongly inspired of the piece and made a, uh, one of the life-size Maya sculpture here. The reason being, uh, Maya here, of Maya is one of the characters which I am going to talk about later, but Maya holding this two, like holding a leaf, which is what? Which is Tattim in Bengali we say, but otherwise it is Shapta Bhakti. Yeah, so which we have in Delhi also. But, so she's holding this leaf which was given to her as a graduate. So in Shanti on the convocation, the, the, the Prime Minister who is the Chancellor comes and offers this leaf to the ongoing students. So this is the people who hold on to it, and, uh, and she is a proud uh, graduate. Next. And um, last year, Kamala Nehru College had asked me um, whether I could do a sculpture for them. I said, of course, I'd be very happy to, because it's right, right there. So I donated this sculpture to Kamala Nehru College in connection with the 50th Year of Kamala College. It was, so it was unveiled. That's the function that you see unveiling the sculpture in their open ground. And then I also thought, well, why was she only a graduate? I and mean, she also did post graduation there. So, <laughs> and so holding both the uh, both hands are engaged with holding those two leaves. So also talking about again bronze, you see, you have these old sculptures, like you have the best of Chola bronzes, you have the Pali period bronzes, the Gupta period. So drawing a lot from those became strong reference for me to make images connected to those. So Nagaraja obviously was one of the most inspiring images, Dance of Shiva. So you had seen the Maya and now this is the Musui, the main character. And uh, he's hosting to be, he's pretending to be, or he himself is sort of believing himself to be a kind of a Shiva image here. And not that. So, Musi as Nantaraj, that's the title next. I'm just showing you what exactly was happening prior to making all these Musi Mayas. So, this was done in 1990 and it was sponsored by India Habitat Center. And uh, I think who also, uh, also was involved in this making of it and after completing the sculpture I have placed it here. When you enter the India Habitat Center you see it on the right side, the Chandela Rider. The sculpture was done after my visit to the Rao. So woman, a female figure riding a dog. Next. Also on the left side of that you have this uh, split on the split base because it's a, uh, you see a kind of a lot many, uh, you know, uh, forms which are uh, almost like kind of a split base, not steady enough, and uh, it's a woman, a figure, trying to sort of find a balance <coughs> in that. So, both the sculptures were purchased by uh, the Habitat Center, and the architect was involved with the making of this building. 
uh, time. We have visited in 90 my studio and said that we are going to have India Heritage Center, so we would like to have the sculpture. And so they have kept in the storage. Once the building came up, it has. So it not, it's not done for the building, for the site. It was definitely, they had the idea of keeping it, but when I placed it, I found that it is not the right scale. So, but still they have, since there are two pieces, it makes some certain sort of presence. Also one of the early sculptures, I am just showing you what exactly was happening prior to, you know, coming, considering these two characters like Lucy and Maya. This is a sculpture titled The World Wind. It's installed, uh, see, last few years, and since from 93 onwards, I was installing many sculptures in France, one particular site in south of France, the province, and uh, this is one of that world wind. Also, is a sculpture that sort of depicts that the, she's stretching herself to the kind of reaching out to the kind of pole, and there is it's pull, the title is the pull, but there's a kind of a tension that's created that she cannot afford to open the thing which will bounce back. So a series of sculptures were made and of that 90 till 96 and uh, the Swamgita so Jindal, the Jindal group, they wanted to have a magazine launched in Calcutta <coughs> and they asked me if I could uh, exhibit in Park, in Park Street. So this this was the, this is Park Street. Oh, in front of you may wondering where is Park Street here, but this is APJ has a long front, just next to the Park Hotel, and this is where it was exhibited and the magazine was launched. It's called a Heart India magazine. Um, one of the sculptures from the early times, again, a woman playing a violin, yeah, but the violin is, she's also not very comfortably postured, but very precarious. Not a com not in that posture also, uh, with the kind of Nail that makes goes through into the wire and uh, still sort of trying to find a music with him. Installed in France. Um, these are all some of the sculptures of those period because till 2000 I have been installing sculptures in various places. Denmark and France was most of it. Next. This is the studio I shifted from. Saki and I had a studio, and then 93 I shifted to, no, yeah, 93 I shifted to Chandrapur, where currently I'm working from. Yes. The first photograph of this is, this is the first sculpture of Musi. Because um, I was a student, Chandra I think a year after I completed, first student, second student. I see this Musi, um, I see this boy, yes, he's a Santal boy. Santals are there plenty <coughs> because there are many villages. Shantaniketan has many villages. So Vishwabhar, the university has many villages, Santal villages. And then you 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 go a kilometer, you know, from the ashram, whichever directions that you get to have these villages. And um, so while coming once, you know, a cycle, and I see this young boy standing by the roadside and asking for bread. So the, basically when I saw him asking for bread with a smile on his face, I was wondering what's that? So I just stopped and then I asked him, not that I knew very well Bangla, but I took him and said, well, you come to my studio. So I had a kind of a small studio and uh, but I will give you some money only after you sit for me as a model. So, so I, he, is, he made a, he, I mean, his, I, those days you can't make a nice structure like that. So I made a head, just the portrait. And he was very smiling face with the kind of uh, very beautiful, I would say handsome young boy. Probably was of same age like me then. And um, uh, I gave him probably two rupees or what. That's all what one could. And then he goes, he comes back after one hour to the same studio and asking Dada. So then I looked at him, he had a clean shaven head. <laughs> so the first income of the two rupees, I think he wanted to have a you know, haircut. I didn't realize it. But anyway, I thought when I looked at him, that was the 
but really amazed that one was looking at you because that's the way the Busi was. Then only I asked him, well, Kire, what's your name? And then he says, Musi. And uh, many, many people today ask me, well, who is Musi? I mean, that is Musi. And Musi is the event. So he became a model for me for some time. Also, I thought maybe I can't afford to give him money like that. Who would be inspired to his over to So I introduced him to the faculty of sculpture. I told Shadur Rajchandraki that she looked at him, he's so beautiful. And, and uh, everybody agreed to the idea of having him as kind of a model, permanent model for all the students to work on him. And so the exercise was that we really had to study the life-size sculptures, and maybe it will take a month or 15 days in clay he had to work. So he was willing to be, uh, you know, letting students to uh, sort of work on him. So this was one of the life studies he had made. So when I left Shantani Kedan after my eight years of stay there, I don't know, I got a fellowship to come to Delhi, and I had basically, I didn't have much to carry. From, you know, when you complete your studies. So, I thought I would chalk his head and take it in me. Because I couldn't have, I could not have taken the life size cut. So, I just had this head and that came with me. That was still in the cement form because bronze we could not afford. So, I did some bronzes. So, I started, I told you, like small tiny figures because casting a small little figure also is an expensive something beyond a student's reach. So the sculpture was brought, cement sculpture was brought to Delhi studio, Delhi and was working in the studio here. And much later he cast in this sculpture. It has become a permanent a kind of a portrait fixed. Always it was there, but I never thought of working with Musi <laughs> as such. But 96, I got this, you know, this ITC company that they have a travel division, it's international travel house. They asked me, could you do a sculpture based on travel as a concept? <coughs> and I just, when I, the moment I thought of travel and people, I connected with people because it's a human thing. Like, you know, some in Shantani, in, in Calcutta, you have this, you know, this pulling pictures. And that came, that was the image that came to me. And they made a, a, this rickshaw, so I just see, I told please, can you get a rickshaw from Calcutta? I would like to cast that into bronze. So they got a real, the real rickshaw cost only 3,000 rupees. To bring it that time, it was costing 30,000 rupees. But they really did, and they gave it to me, and I, I started putting the mold, and I cast it this, and I thought, who would be the rickshaw holder? That was the time first I felt. The sculpture was done of Musi was in 1975. <laughs> And in 1996, Musi becomes the rickshaw puller here. Because I thought I am not going to make a kind of a struggling puller, rickshaw puller, as someone who is celebrating it, someone who is so passionate about life, someone who is sort of, it's not like a pulling, it's a kind of a choreographed character just between these bars. And, and what should be the passenger like? And there I took, maybe it could be a crow. And the sculpture is installed on the rooftop of the building in Sheikh Sarai in Delhi. If somebody is passing the Sheikh Sarai market complex that you can look up, you will see plane. Of course, there are a lot of planes and things, aeroplanes and all. But you can also see this rickshaw kept on the third floor of the building. You can see it from the street. And it's what I have taken by Prabhupada's next. It was big enough that even I could sit in it. See then this Musi and Maya. So the, why the concept of Maya comes? Because I was working on those a series of sculptures. Musi becoming, they are becoming this and that, and hosting various icons which are familiar or unknown. And then I thought maybe this will help me to sort of to have conceive the the other side, the counterpart. So Maya was formed. But Maya is here, exactly the same Musi's head, added you know, hair and little bit of no changes. It's, you might think it's really different from Musi. It's exactly the same head and added certain features to that to make it feminine. Next. So this is the 
Musi and Naya, but you can see the same head, it is absolutely, but it's inseparable kind of character. They are really sort of conceived as one and uh, integrated into one, actually. Next. So the sculpture here, it's like kind of a splitting of a pillar. The title is Portal, making kind of a gate by splitting a pillar and uh, you know, both the characters are clinging onto that. The pillar becomes the other. You know, one leg of that. So one is outstretched, one is sort of stooping, a kind of a combination. And the sculpture is installed in Jindalino. So um, this was also the same time, 96, 90s end. I got this offer of a fantastic site in south of France. They had palm trees. And then they asked me if I could come up with some idea of some sculptures open air. Then I thought, again, Musi becomes an impish character. So that impishness, that, that kind of, the kind of smile could be really interpreted into various kinds. So Musi, Maya becomes an impish uh, figure here. So Musi, Mayas, they are all in the artisan to the all within the kind of palm trees. Almost like a sort of uh, a <coughs> characters, you know. Yeah, and then, um, the, this is again why Musi becomes a rat catcher. Because uh, the rat trap film was seen by, uh, I mean, it was made by Adur, Govalakrishnan. And uh, I, when I saw this, I didn't know that I would ever make, make this kind of sculpture based on that. but. Uh, but I just wanted to know that, you know, that Musi becomes so ordinary a human being and Musi becomes so simple and so rooted and he hosting, he's becoming this as a rat catcher. But the story also of the film is that, that, uh, you know, he's the character, you know, the main character in the film also is sort of a trap, you know, in the rat trap. And he here also, he, Musi is very happy, who, you know, catching rats inside, but he himself is in the rat trap. Yeah, so, but some, somehow you have to take Musi out of it, holding on to it as a freehold figure. Next. And then Maya becoming a writer. What that is? Yeah. yeah, because it's a, Maya becoming a writer because uh, I think that was the time my, my wife was a painter. She studied from Baroda, but then she started seriously writing. And I said, oh wow, so Maya could be a writer too. <laughs> So she's a creature, yes. It's like kind of, I cannot say that this is in the collection of, you know, this uh, Sudhir Kakir in Goa. And uh, I just wanted to have these characters basically in the open air. They are life size. And uh, uh, the, the kind of distortions, the kind of, you know, elongated body, and because it goes beyond what you normally understand with the kind of human structure. So Musi becomes Jesus here. And also the, the devil. So if he can become a Jesus, he can also be that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the, this, this is the kind of sculptures when I start realizing that the writer with this, that, you know, they're so airborne sculptures. They're you know, like the way you had seen that Natraj sculptures, that you have the kind of minimum base contact and spreading it to a kind of whichever directions their arms and legs spread to and and it's like heavy bronze sculptures. You can really if you know how to really handle them in a different way, you can really make a kind of a it's, it's not uncomfortable looking at it. And it's it's it also evokes the lightness like what this year said. So, violinist was one of the subjects actually. I really had done even before the Musi came. So, becomes the <coughs> violinist. So, on one side it's a Brahmin, on the other side it's a Mullah and Rasputin. Mm -hmm. So, here is one of the models that I had made for 
uh, you know, the vertical horizontal, but you know, it's just a structure based on, you have a, a column, you hold on to it, so it's like kind of a determined you know, existence, that against any odd situation, but you, you still hold on to something that is connected to the road. And this is a, a small model, it's only four feet high. And uh, so when you are on the wave, basically this, this has come as an image to me many times because there is a kind of, you know, she goes to the crest of the wave and doesn't know how to find a balance how to, because it's the only chance is to fall this side or that. But finding a kind of a way of, but it had to be conceived as a circular structure for her to come into that position. So he becomes a Kathakali dancer. Kalamandalam Musi. Yes, and, and, he, and she, Maya becomes a windmill. Not that they become only characters, they also become objects that can really sort of generate energy. Yes. And uh, so he becomes, on the other side, you can see on a big granite stone, both the sides, there are two windmills. And they, I just want to sort of, they're holding each other's head here. Yeah, and you know, it's like, so, so much together that uh, even if they are separate, but then still hold on to themselves, each other. It's first time they're coming together on the, on the base, same base, very air-bound, air-bound and extremely celebratory kind of characters. And this is installed at the site in Jindal's. Next one is also is a, another version of the Musi and Mayas because you make uh, different versions and different sides and scales. And so Maya becomes an angel. A Durga, because this I told you about this Durga as, as a character, Mahisha, so this combination I have worked to really sort of recurrently. Was coming to my sculptures and becomes a tree goddess. They are on the railings, and also my sponsors are on the other side because all this was possible because of my sponsors. I mean, there to be somebody really taking care of that part, letting me cast more sculptures and things like that, south of France. And the uh, sculpture seen against the other side of the water, kept on the crest of the water. Almost like kind of, so you really see when you are there. And the site, is, the site was so inspiring in South of France. And then Delhi uh, Tourism, they had asked me if I could do a Mahia or Musi for their Garden of Five Senses. And the sculpture was installed there. And it was almost on the rock, there were no trees to interfere, nothing. But today, when you go there, there are a lot many trees, and you don't almost get to see the sculpture because. Yeah, so I, I asked them, well, you see, I gave you something on the rock, and why did you dilute it? You know, it's like, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, so, but uh, you don't get to see the way it is seen in the beginning when it was installed. So with all these characters of Musi and Mayas, later I started sort of, I shifted my studio from um, Sake to, to Chhatrapur. It's a kind of a, uh, what you call it? Not a regular colony, one of those colony that has that was just forming up, a kind of uh, you know distributed plotted land and still to become a kind of a colony. And people were coming from all over, <coughs> from different states to this party. So I made a series. I used to sort of look at from my studio the way the colonies, the people are making homes, square cubes, and people coming, falling, living. <laughs> One of those, so I started making a series of sculptures called the Human Box. And it's like kind of getting into all kinds of forms, and they're tiny figures. And I always sort of, they are, because when you look at these people in the in the in this colony, you know, their individual characters are not so important there. It's really anonymous. Tiny figures are featured, not, not featured enough. Normally. So they have all kinds of shapes that they're, Getting into, getting into the vessels and yeah. So a series of vessels I made as a content container, kind of a structure which is like kind of a global 
and connecting with the global migration of people who wanting to be going always somewhere else. So people were coming, forming. So this was done in Orissa and outside the temple. I mean, I was invited to participate in a camp. And I had these characters, all these people, these tiny characters that I had, I traveled with them. When they have people invite me for a camp or something. So that I can do something on the site itself. You know, right? So I bought these vessels which were used for worshipping offering vessels. So where to go and build it? So I found a guy who was sitting on the roadside, a rickshaw. You know, the cycle repairer, he had a very small little welding machine. So I started putting all these people become. So they become here, the, bar, the bucket becomes a milk. On the vessel it becomes rice or paddy or whatever. And you know, the lamb, all kinds of. They were forming and what were the use that was made for the vessel. Next. So then they also get into the heads of Musuis and Mayas. And this is when, you know, I thought, okay, they are too tiny to be seen there, this thing. And then you have the prominent featured Musi and Maya. But I started making it around maybe 13 inches, you know, tall, these small figures. And uh, Musi and Maya going for a walk, basically. It's so simple. They are just together on a, a kind of a higher platform next. So they become num much more in numbers here because it's five figure ram. It's like kind of taking a shape of a ram and becoming more getting crowded when you have 10 or 6 and then become 10 in numbers. It's a kind of this is evolving into a kind of a getting into a crowded situation. And uh, also I could see the colony becoming so crowded. And uh, this is just to show how it's been being made here you know, because all these sections parts of this human body, which are all in aluminium, various materials that you cast them and uh, and then put them together with various kind of choices that you make by placing it, whichever directions and building it. And so you can see this is the kind of, the way things are in the shelf, in the studio. Some of the studio shots were taken by Prabhupada Sutta, one of the best photographers. So it's on a on a bronze base. They start sort of uh, making it not a performance, but a kind of lot of movements. Yeah, I mean I wouldn't call it. Are they really depicting some kind of? They are all individuals. They are movements, but not with their features. The features the same. They are all Muslims and Mayas. Yeah, but just by placing it, the, the variations that you can see next. Yeah becoming much more crowded and then I started con I considered this two Ram. One was with the Ram Krishna as a main character and on the other side you had Sharada, Sharada Ma on the other side. So you you will see the Ram, these two characters based on Musi, Ram Krishna, Maya, Sharada. So you can see the legs of Ram Krishna in the middle of this crowd. You can see the details, and that's yeah. Musi we'll will come to the Ram Krishna, and the Ram Krishna is there. See, the idea is that you know it's this this ascending structure. You know that starts from the from the ground and then takes to the kind of a different height, and this enlightened saint standing in the middle of the crowd. So also sort of. It's a Musri. The Musri becomes and also the characters on the ground. They are small but they are Musris. But so to be perfect also doesn't have to be something that comes from elsewhere. To be perfect also is one from the ground. One from. That was this basic idea of next. So you have the Sharada seated. So I just wanted to just oppose this too. You know, the vertical standing Musri as Krishna and the Sharada on the other side. It's a detail of the seated figure. It's a scene, you know, from the from the top. It's almost like kind of a, a, a city plaza kind of. Thing. You have these tiny characters, individual with individual moments. Yeah. Yeah. So, making on these. 
you know this uh, you know two different scales of pussies as large standing large life starts in the life and then you have the standing and then i start working on individual figures but then i never conceive them as one particular piece also sort of because whenever i made things i made them in the series so this is a, uh, my choice was here the freehold figures but i think that was probably one of the time. i don't know why i gave the title freehold because i was buying a property and somebody asked me hey, the one damn the flat that you buy is is it freehold and i didn't realize exactly is it freehold or not and you know one of those and then um, i also wanted to know is kosi freehold or maya freehold and one of that exercises so the moment i started knowing whether they are and they could show me all kinds of moments this word that they could really perform before me and so they are extremely they are almost like getting out of that pillar <clears throat> and you know which of course physically just not possible but it's almost like i could see them uh, floating in there you know but that that human pillar was with the little tiny figures was just a support for them to be at bond next so we can see that all these characters are been so i'm just playing this i'm just showing you more visuals of this free world series because it, it was not complete with one or two sculptures so i had really i kept on making maybe more than 25 sculptures of all kind of uh, movements and it is not really taken straight from the realistic references or anything you don't see them moving like that but yes but it became so real for me after they did it or i of it's been made on the elbows and yeah i'm going vertical going basically that like kind of characters are freaking out yeah previous one also is came to me as because she's again a writer as a writer she comes to me sometime upside down and I think in the process of making this series, I became freehold. That's what exactly I did. Yes. <laughs> you see, even on the pillars, there are figures. Yeah, there are tiny figures on that because it, because it was like kind of like the human presence, a kind of a human humanness to be added to that because always becomes too, you know, organic, very product-like, and it's become very human. The, the face is always the same. I never made any changes of the heads because always the head is based on that. Head only the rest of the things are made. Because when people ask me, do you make every time a head? No, I don't. Sincerely speaking, the head is already there with me. So I'm just making the. It's never empty process. So it becomes, and this was shown in that in Bombay, in one of the museum gallery, and uh, the kind of response was fantastic. The crowd came. They started singing. Yeah, all kinds of programs, classical, rock bowls, and all kinds of programs were held because they were all wanting to perform in the middle of it because it was so. It created an atmosphere. Next, next, you can see. It created an atmosphere. It was almost like being in the woods. These characters uh, uh, created a kind of a space. And the ceiling was that good. Lighting was good. It was seen. Like I want, I, when many people came, they didn't want to go inside. They wanted to see it from distance, you know, from the door itself, and then making kind of an entry into the kind of woods, because it's all same scale, which is life size. Oh, well, um, you see, after all that, he's seated for a while, <laughs> and. Uh, you see, I mean, Maya becomes a, you know, on the tiny, on the bamboo, you know, the kind of the Chinese. So this was the start of my China visit. I had a, a Silk Road visit of China and coming back, uh, she becomes a Thai writer. So Chinese letters. And the sculpture is installed in Uttarayan, a foundation which is in, you know, established in Baroda. The foundation has many sculptures, so Musi becomes uh, 
Okay, so the full CMA has seen various losses next. So they have done it here on a kind of a much larger scale. Also, they have put together four, three Musuis and one Maya, and this, like, this is with the Shivna you know, in, in, in Noida. And Maya walking on the wave. Yeah, she's seen with the details. Here and again, another kind of a ram. And this was the reason, because this is an Egyptian vase, which has all these tiny figures, you know, on the on the on the jar you can see, and also they are getting into it because she's I mean that that's protected as the treasure, you know, Egyptian next. And the sculpture is like here, it's the Egyptian goddess called Selkit. And Selkit is a kind of a guardian goddess looking at um, almost like guardian humanity or what. So it's also considered as a ram structure. And it was shown for the first India, India Art Fair in Delhi, in the open. And when you look at these tiny figures, sometimes you can really see that are they really sort of walking individually without anything else on their shoulder? But yes, sometimes you know you can see them, when you make them bigger, then you can see these characters maybe sometimes walking with a boat. Next. Maybe a home she's carrying. Also, sort of sheltered by himself. And also, he becomes a turtle here. And Musi decides to sort of look into the mirror, and then he sees Maya. And goes through one of those Moroccan gates. It's basically, I did things where whenever I travel to Morocco, to Egypt, to all these countries, and, you know, and then I come back and I, you know, they host various characters. So, Musi becomes this and that. The Moroccan gate on the human square. And there's, you know, all these Musis and Mayas are crossing the void. Um, they can, they really did. Yes. And also on a different kind of with the migrating characters in the middle, on a ram. You know, this, um, the tiny characters there, mount, and then you have the human square. Details of those tiny characters. Sometimes I try, why not, in copper directly if I can cast some. And this is where I made, you know, this one of the sculptures. Like, you have these characters and you have the square, you wanted, like, you know, this, um, uh, they are being looked at by someone above you. So it's, I call it a character called Terra Fly, because the fly is there on the crest of the pillar and taking any view of that. You may not look at it. You may, you may see it only by looking at it, but you are being looked at. The idea came from that, and uh, I wanted to make it bigger, and uh, I had the chance, to, I was offered in 2006, the faculty of fine arts in Shandaniki then asked me if I could do a sculpture where I studied. So I knew the exact location where it's appropriate. So I did it in Shandaniki Kalabhavan, Shandaniki, the big scale sculpture. And uh, that's Shabari Roy Chaudhary, that you could see the Shabari with the Bede Gulamani. And now uh, we were together. And, uh, and he came and asked me, why did you make only a pillar? You had a very good chance to make a beautiful sculpture, and you made only a pillar. And then uh, next, I told him, why don't you look up? There's something else on the pillar. <laughs> and then he was convinced, oh, I didn't realize that, yes. There is something. That was brought to Delhi here, Lalitkal Academy, one of the editions. And Maya also becomes a Terra Fry, because you are not partial normally with anybody. And it's a wall, <coughs> mounted a wall, and the kind of characters sort of getting stuck to this human wall, getting into a home. Uh, okay, on the wave, the wave itself is conceived like enough on the wave and the boat and these people. 
it's all basically going with the flow. You know, this I started working on this with these tiny characters, and they really kind of create a kind of a world with that. And and that's here yeah, the the boat is inserted into their world. So it's like the boat is conceived. So it's like kind of it could be a human web or I don't, I'm, I'm just running, I think you might get bored of seeing the same time, so I'm just sort of... So the head is instead, instead the head is inserted into these human breath, these tiny characters. And almost like kind of smoke comes out, but they are really as big figures. Or are they really coming down or up? I mean, it's a kind of a thing which is to be really gone. Unless you really see it from distance, you can see it from distance and coming closer, you understand which direction it is coming. And you know, it's like end of the lamp. Wherever there is, it's like fireflies almost. This was done last uh, sometime back, two weeks back, or maybe last month. I was in Shanti and then invited for a workshop. So I collect, I collect, collected these characters and a street light. So, and this was uh, thousands of those tiny figures were with me to create a piece for the China Beijing Biennale. I have this again coming back to coming back to you know this again uh, uh, a different scale of human figures like what the ramp that you had seen. So hundreds and hundreds of figures are cast and it stacked into my studio. It's one of the shots taken by Prabhu. And they are all welded together after casting this song is happening. And when it is welded, they become individual characters with their individual movements. And then you know start sort of uh, replanting them on a kind of a base, you know, like kind of a, um, yeah. You are just sort of placing it accordingly because you are not. It's not very well planned then, you know, because you have these figures with you and you have the almost like a paddy field. So you are replanting, you know, this uh, yeah, the seedlings. Yes, that's right. So you have um, the castor sculptures. Putting them in a different order. So by placing only you decide where to come. Even by building, you understand what's the moment. Everything can be so much planned. It's almost like writing a script, you know, on the site itself. So hundreds of figures are casted and trying to stop. I worked two years on this piece. Two years with almost ten assistants and five thousand kilos of bronze. And I just devoted just for this piece, it's called the liminal figures and liminal uh, space. The whole studio I could not do. In fact, I could not do, I didn't have space enough to work on another sculpture because it was fully occupied by the same piece. It's almost like working on and uh, getting welded and placing them next. Yeah. Yeah, the whole, I mean, took, I don't know how to explain because I enjoyed the whole process of making it. And uh, once it's made, it becomes, you know, you distance yourself from that. And uh, so this is the complete detailed version of the next. So this is where it starts. The, the first figure on a vertical and almost like taking off horizontal figure, that's where the figure starts next. And it goes into a kind of a large ramp that's around 60 feet long. Yeah. And the number of figures were, I didn't count it. I was told 643 or so. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> I could not take it to many galleries for the reason that many galleries cannot take it to this. So, so Lelithkal Academy, the first show was in the Lelithkal Academy in Calcutta mm -hmm. and came to here. But I wanted to show it in Bombay and maybe it will happen sometime next. You know, this, so this liminal figures from the very ground it's going, it's almost like art filling. There are seven figures at the end you can see a ball, a large ball here and, uh, with the shadow of which they picked in the space beyond. That's the scale of the sculpture. Which is, this sculpture will be seen coming art fair. Uh, to 
be displayed clearly. And I am showing one of this Bhusmaya becomes an arrow here, and also she the arrow, and both the arrow and the bow, both. And then Chandni came in 150 years of Chagur. They asked me if I could do a sculpture for Chandni Kedan. And uh, I was happy that they had offered me one of the prime locations in, in Uttarayan, in the campus where Chagur's house. Detail of the sculpture. She is the arrow and the bow. Seen again in the courtyard of Chagur's home. I kept on working on this air bound various kinds of characters, but then the scale became much bigger. And then I also got into the habit of making many more open air sculptures. And in Kalikit city, I had the opportunity that they had offered me one of the prime locations of the city. It's called Manachara Maidan, where I wanted to make uh, an open air sculpture. So I used this granite to take it up because, see, what happens is that you make a bronze, if you put it down, I mean, it will not be there. That's the kind of culture we have because bronze is an expensive medium, people are not used to sort of living with that in open air, just like that. So in many cases I am bound to take it to a kind of a height where people cannot reach. <laughs> yeah, because but even if you, if you look at even Sabha Patel or Gandhiji statues and any of the statues even, people take it to the height because, uh, you know, if it is reachable, they will cut one arm and, <laughs> and uh, buy a bottle of rum or whatever. So it's, it's really difficult in this country. I think hope it happens so that I can bring down and make it really reachable where people can easily touch the bronze. But I had to use granite here to take it to the height because that's the only thing that can hold this bronze. Because the work above that's 10 feet bronze. You know, that's... And so the, the stone here is around 15 feet, so it's 25 feet. And uh, it was the prime location and uh, I really made a mess of it by bringing crane and the grass was all spoiled and and I had to work in the night so that nobody disturbs me and morning they come and ask me what the hell happened, you know, like in one of those. Next day, I started sort of, I see people coming, you know, next day morning I was watching how the reaction is going to be with us. And uh, probably, and you can see the scale, the people, you know, like the huge. Yeah. And also I wanted this, you know, Kerala tile, Manglu tiles to be carved on them because I wanted that actually in bronze on the ground, which I could not have. So people were still sort of accepting this as a public sculpture for themselves and they started coming and photographing and making their own. It's not anymore my sculpture. But the subject was the time tide, you know, it's the, the Kala Prava. And and then I started creating the mound because the grass sort of it took some six months for the grass to come and be in place. The ground was prepared. Insert the stones got inserted into the ground. And uh, that's the way the sculpture today stands in Karikat. Thank you so much. discussion maybe. Uh, one thing that, uh, you know, in your week had a lot of conversations about many of uh, these things because there's a lot to talk about. One thing that we mentioned in one of our conversations is about this metal being a very heavy metal. And if you look at his characters, they're all airborne and there's a kind of sense of lightness and buoyancy about this. So I asked him, like, how Oh, how do you relate to this? And he said uh, something very, very curious and something which is very important for us at Leela. 
because Leela is playing and uh, uh, you know it, there's happiness about it, buoyancy, lightness about it. But uh, this buoyancy and lightness cannot be taken for granted. There is a certain kind of uh, solidity you know, which makes it possible for us to come and be light. You know. So the same way, he, he said something very important. He said it is because this metal is so heavy that it can, you can, can really cast it in whatever way so that it stays, it, it is grounded, it doesn't fall off, you know. So it is possible for him to cast uh, the, any kind of scale and lightness at that scale because, because of this gravity, uh, because of this, this uh, heaviness of the metal. So there is this curious kind of relationship between uh, substance, substantial, you know, kind of density and the possibility of lightness which is emerging from there, which is what we, we actually try to achieve at Leila, you know. So you, you, there has to be a way of looking at knowledge, uh, living knowledge lightly, but at the same time, you know, without taking it for granted. So I think that is one lesson that uh, we really uh, get from uh, Rafa. Another thing which I yeah, I am reminded of is there is this urban legend about Leonardo da Vinci, where uh, this Last Supper. He it seems he had used the same model for uh, uh, Judas and uh, uh, Jesus. You know, there's this urban legend about, and uh, uh, so this is something like that. Like you know, it's the same person who becomes. Uh, like he, he once he Da Vinci it seems met this person on the street, so happy and you know so so radiant. So he thought you know, he should be my model for uh, Jesus. And a few months or years later, he well, months later I think he saw the same guy in a, in a prison, and he was completely different. So he thought like this. The same, this is an urban legend. I don't know how far it is true, but the possibility of the same person becoming this or that, or you know, the scale of uh, existential uh, possibilities that is uh, also which really come through in um, uh, uh, in this presentation, and also the the urgency of that pouring out. Right? It's also that character of the metal, like metal. This gets solidified if you don't really catch, seize that moment of pouring. Like the, it is in the urgency of the pouring of the metal that it, the, the form comes to be. And if you miss that moment, it becomes a deformed thing. It, it, it gets solidified into something else. Your imagination will go somewhere else and what you get would be something else. So the urgency, the, the importance of catching time, being with time, uh, these are things which valuable lessons which are coming from this presentation. I open this uh, uh, for discussion. Uh, uh, I hope the good questions and comments come. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know where is Musi these days? <laughs> I thought I, I'm still around. <laughs> yeah. You're asking the original Musi or all right? Okay. I thought the Musi was I conceived. <laughs> yeah, Musi is normal. Uh, I have a kind of a question. Or a, thanks for this. Yeah. Well. Uh, Thanks for this very interesting presentation. You have a large body of work. My question was rather on uh, uh, public art and in public spaces in India. Yeah. Now, these spaces where you work, essentially the kind of sculpture you do a lot of it, the large scale, is actually in public spaces, or are these like semi private public place, uh, public spaces? What kind of spaces are these? Um, I, I, I because there's a larger argument here about yes. what we're trying to make about yes. art in yes. India, especially in public places, yeah. and uh, yeah. the commission of public art in India, where it picked very kind of, you know, it's accessible to everybody and everybody yeah, can partake of it. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. It's a very good question because I did many public sculptures here in India, but whatever I did was a commission. It was not commissioned. 
I didn't take any money. And I have no intention of taking any money also. For one reason. One, uh, the public space is it's a, it's a government land. And most cases, because when I was told to Garden of Five Senses in 90, what, 95, 96 or I don't know, that was the time. Garden of Five Senses, they asked me, can you do a sculpture? I said, yeah, of course, I'd be very much willing to do it. And I went to the company, you know, it's, it's a daily tourism. They had their chairman and, you know, IAS officers and all so. so I went and they asked me, you know, Mr. Alakshan, you are the first doctor invited for this Garden of Five Senses, and, uh, and uh, but, yeah, I'm very glad that you invited me and I'm very willing to do it. But he said, but we have an idea. The moment I said, heard that he had an idea, <laughs> then I said, well, what am I doing here? Then? If you just want me to, you know, implement your idea or fabricate your idea, what, is, what are you looking at? And he was the chairman of I mean, he was the cultural secretary, who was also a part of I said, of course, secretary of culture can definitely have an idea, but then he, I cannot say, keep your idea with you. <laughs> but I said, well, uh, um, I, would, I would not do a sculpture in hearing about your idea, but uh, even if you don't pay me, I would still prefer to do my idea. So he caught me there. So even if you don't <laughs> and he said, oh, in that case, we are not paying you. <laughs> I said, that's okay, but at least I have, I can do, I can do. And that was the first donation I did. And after that, I understood many committees, there are many secretaries of that kind, who would say that they was, one, there was a lady who, some told you, Mrs. Tawdry, that sort of she, she was a, she was a, Minister asked me to do a sculpture for a roundabout, and then I went to the. I was very happy that she invited me, and then I said, "Do you have? Uh, would, 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 would you do this piece? And this is the time frame we have to do it within a few months." And I said, "I would be very happy to do it. It's a very prime location." She also said, "I have an idea." <laughs> and then I said, "Listen, I mean, uh, I will send to one of my students. Yes. If the student is willing to hear your idea, that." Right. So it was not done. Many cases I found a public sculpture is not done with proper way it is meant to be in the African other countries. Yes. For Konak Place, after making the metro, they asked me for a piece. I said, well, fine. Then I asked, who are the people you approached? They said, five sculptors. We produced both of them, we the Reddy, and all kinds of people were chosen. But we had a really series of meetings and nothing happened. Unless you donate, it, it doesn't work. So you get the freedom, you are buying the freedom. Like the Kerala, the sculpture that I had done for the city, the location is fantastic. But the sculpture was cast in Jayapur, it went from there, even for the truck, I had to pay. To reach there, to install there. Now I am doing another sculpture because the chief minister of Kerala thought, you did born in Kadiket, that's not the city that you were born. You were born in Kote. <coughs> So you have to do one in Gautam. So I said, of course, I would be very happy, but can, can you let me choose the site? And he said, of course, the whole city is open, choose the site. So it was a fantastic site, and I'm doing now. It's just to make it, it goes very expensive. But I thought, I will sell some of the large sculptures to private collections, like Ambani's. And that certain money I will put aside, say 20% of that. And I will give public sculptures, come, you know, donate it, and they are there forever. That's rather sad, actually. Uh, for me, I think. Maybe you could do that. Everybody else perhaps can't do I'm, that. I'm very, yeah, it's true. It's true. It's very sad. That's not the way it should be. I'm able to do it because I have this private, and you know, the gallery is taking care of me, and, and yeah, it's very true. It should not happen the way. And I always say, you know, that uh, about having a chance, you made me speak. So I said. Yeah, I think we have a question. Uh, two questions. Um, so this is very interesting because what you showed uh, on the very form of the presentation was like bombarding us with so many works. You know? So you have done so many works. And when we think of like the most prolific like songwriters or artists, they have like maybe <coughs> one thousand songs in life, and that's huge. And here you have done like hundreds of works, and some of them. 
uh, are made of like hundreds of smaller pieces. And uh, I think that's already part of the answer of this challenge. Um, also in terms of creation, in terms of art, and its connection with the economy is that you have to uh, insist on the quality, but also you're producing. And you're giving a lot to the world. And, and at some point, it will come back. And the, the, the artist can enter the economy uh, more confidently. But my first question is, how do you, like here, all these, those two characters become this, and they become that, and they become this, and they become that. First, how do you manage to be so um, um, energetic in catch, catching one small idea when then, you know, waking up saying something, then doing it, then passing on the next one? That's the first question. How do you suggest one can go with this type of incredible energy? And my second question is, um, <coughs> as this happens, and you work for 40 years, and uh, you have so many small parts of you in the world now. How do you feel about them? How, what is your emotion about your, your work? Because they are there, they, you have seen them coming to life from your idea to the making, every small part you decided, and finally it's there. And for the, for the world out there, it's, it wasn't there, now it's there. For you, the idea came, the making happened, and then it was there. So how do you relate on a personal level with each of these sculptures? Yeah, the first question is like, where do I get the energy from? I suppose I, I'm, I'm not really sort of spending my energy on it actually. Sincerely, I am gaining the energy by making it. Because one series of it, like Pussy Mayas, when I make one of the characters becoming this, and for the, for the other one, that this energy that has been sort of that I gain by doing that is given the next. So it's a kind of a kind of just flow of, you know, like, yeah. and so also it's meant to evoke some kind of an energy, which is like in the ram that you can see from the crowd because people look at it individually, also in a collective structure. So I think it's it's delivering a kind of a uh, from an unknown space to you know to the known and uh, known people. So energy level is basically sort of something that you gain by making it. You know, I remember making, you know, Durga is the goddess of power and so you're making one, you gain the power. You're not losing. You know, you know by making. You know, sometimes the Durga is made just for when you are really going into this thing, okay, I'm going to make one of that, you know, to make me stand on my foot. You know, that's not uh, uh, kind of a recycled or or uh, you know, sort of it's like kind of, you know, you are you see that uh, a kind of a wave, a figure that comes to the crest of it, but then you know, you, it's like kind of a round ball that comes to the crest and then it loses. It doesn't stay. By losing it gains. So which means the kind of basic cosmic that, you know, the cycle that, you know, you lose it and with that, that energy takes you to the next wave up. So on the crest you normally don't fall, you make another one. That's what it's and uh, talking about the sculptures being made and sometimes you see what happens especially for certain sites. You make a sculpture and I haven't seen the site where it's going to be. Like, you know, like some of the large sculptures that I know, this is the site, this is the scale and this is the kind of people coming in. Even I had to naturally check what the kind of people, what's the age group, what's their background, how they're going to be grouped at. Those studies also are being made sometimes. But in certain cases like in France, Denmark, even New Zealand or in Chicago, I installed sculptures, but where I don't know, well, you know, the site sometime. Because you go there with the sculpture and while you're installing, you see the site. Sometimes it conflicts, conflicts because it's so oh, it's not meant for that. Then I consulted the sponsors, maybe it could be better there. So there's a kind of so sculptures are uh, it's it's being decided because it moves, sculptures moves and I follow that and then find the right places where it was not there, it's being made there. So it's a site that that decides where it comes from. And it's, so it's a daily kind of a discovery. And sometimes the sculpture is seen, you know, it could have been there yesterday. Till yesterday it was planned to be there. And today it's somewhere else. And also I have really changed, sometimes changed, you know, after 10 years, I go to South of France and I say, Oh no, why can't we really change and see it's fantastic. I still go there whether I work for them or not. I go there <coughs> once a year to see how they are. 
they are still in good mood and nicely kept. Yeah, I suppose this is a way of it's a way of living with it. I have a question. Yes, please. So, uh, one of the important element which is really related to art is perception, right? And um, uh, making sculptures is uh, probably your mode of expressing your emotions and your imagination. So, uh, a writer or an artist usually has an audience in mind. Uh, so my question is, how important is it for you that the audience perceives the sculpture exactly the way you want to portray it? Uh, it's a very good question, but at the same time, um, you know, you, you always hope that it is seen the same light, same spirit, same source that you really had it drawn from and being made for a kind of a particular space for the kind of people. Like I told you, like we have to send these two sculptures which are there. I didn't know the site. The building was not even built. Like two pieces that you have here. So, I mean, so you really cannot really expect the right installations. You may have done that, you know. But at the same time, um, uh, some of the very planned sculpture for a particular site, even after doing that, and over a period of time, I went, you know, to a sculpture, you know, uh, after five years, you know, in Shantani Kedan, and they didn't know it was made by me. Some people explained that piece to me. And I was just trying to understand what exactly he was trying to sort of, you know, and he was, are you are you understanding? He was asking me, do you, do you get it? And, you know, then I really felt, it was fantastic. A kind of an explanation. Not necessarily it was it had anything to do with the intention that I had. I think that liberty they should have. And and let them. You know, because you are not going to get to the spirit of you know, like if you look at Gornica as a painting, Picasso's Gornica. You don't know what were those people doing within the character. And who are these? Who are those people? Very tough to know. One was his girlfriend, one was his ex-girlfriend. One was the one he's having an affair with. <laughs> so all these women were there. But you, you know, so I'm trying to say there is a kind of a personal element that comes into it. But when you look at the painting, but you can still look at it in a very impersonal space. You know? So, oh, I mean, that sort of uh, thing, like Indian miniatures painting. If you look at, you know, that the Akbar goes to hunting scenery or there are, the artist is told, the court painters were told that, you know, we are going, so he obviously, the artist had to sort of sit and paint. And where do they get the freedom from? Where, do, where is that? There's no personal freedom at all. But maybe in the crowd, one of, you know, his wife's head is there, one of the characters. And he kept it to himself. He, so that's where he takes little bit of, that, you know, that happiness in an anonymous space, that he gets it. So I suppose, Certain things are looked at uh, not in its own spirit, but at the same time it could be somewhere closer to. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah. Going back to the question about Masui earlier, um, I was wondering if you could talk about um, your feelings about the responsibility of an artist when it comes to the treatment of the subject of poverty more broadly. Do you follow me? Poverty as a subject material, yeah, and then artist's responsibility with that subject. Mm, that's, uh, uh, yeah, of course it is, yes, always. <laughs> now, it all depends on how do you, again, perceive the whole thing, because, um, you see, um, certain sculptures that I have done, I have always told that, you know, the early sculptures also you could see that, uh, you know, this the precarious situation, of the biggest kind of problems that they come from day to day life. But still sort of, it was time sort of to create an image of the music being played in a way, the situation also of that kind. But now, um, especially, my, especially the studio that I have where in Delhi, I get to see I'm in the middle of so many problems that people face in Chhatrapur. It's a kind of a very what they call it, it's not a regularized colony, it is legal constructions, basic 
facilities are not there if you are seeing. But all what one could do is to address it and bringing it to your work to a certain extent that we are explaining it. And there are many, many, many literature, many texts are written about the source of this sculptures where it is coming from and then we explain it and things like that. So I think that's only way it can be really reaching to a kind of a larger audience about the kind of problems these people face. So the human boxes was probably one of the answers to and a direct kind of an expression with the, with the way I experienced, you know, by seeing them, the kind of struggle that they have. So that naturally gets reflected in one way or other in your own work. That's an artist's responsibility to be. Because, you know, well, even my teacher, Ramki Garbage, he did many sculptures, many paint, many paintings based on Bengal family, family in 1940s. So all lot of things, but at the same time, I don't know how many how many people really sort of it made an impact on the people who really looked at those paintings. So you can only hope for people reacting to it and finding out where is this coming from, what's the kind of problems that the artist really faced, or what are the kind of things that he looked at, what inspired them or what sort of transferred it from. So this is the only way one can look at it. I just meant even more specifically in relation to this like, ironic situation where the, um, the muse of pursuing um, is on this pedestal so high up that it has to be kept out of the way from the people who could potentially cut him to pieces to, to resell the metal. I just think that that's yeah. See being kept on the higher base, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Huh? And uh, you cannot be really come down to the reach of the people. Yeah, so I mean, I appreciate that it's important that the subject of poverty is brought to a wider audience, and that's that's sort of um, passing on some sort of message about the plight of humanity in some, in some way. But when Masui himself is elevated, um, because he's made out of material that is too expensive to be put on the level of the people, then it's just this is the, this that's a paradox that's a paradoxical nightmare, right? In lots of ways. Yeah, I understand because it's the, it's the you say that it's the poverty that makes them to be sort of uh, not able to sort of live with it, or or we are scared also of to bring down to the kind of ground for because it's the situation. And also, it's not the poverty. I think it's a, it's sensibilities also. There's kind of a you know they are not used to having something so. A, a, a metal on the ground. A metal as a medium cannot really be on the ground. Even in this, the, you know, even if it's iron, some kind of, you know, this uh, leaves of this uh, silver and things like that, even doesn't stay there for reasons because it's all, it doesn't stay among here. Because I think, you know, I don't know whether I think I'm able to sort of to tell you because. Mm, the, some of the sculptures that were done, like Chandrika, that the piece that was done was in a secured place, I was happy to do. Because many of the sculptures of my teacher were stolen. Many of the public sculptures were stolen. So what do you do? Of course it reflects the poverty. I mean, maybe it's the reason they have their own reason to steal it. But uh, well, we cannot really sort of encourage that uh, to bring down an expensive metal to the ground. Uh, can I also just briefly respond to what uh, you said? Like, hey, it's also like, you know, when you're talking about art, um, uh, you know, why art and its aesthetic is um, different from perhaps a kind of direct social expression, uh, direct kind of activism. Uh, art, ha art is active in a, in a subtle, oblique manner. So it has its aesthetic, which is in a different way. So it, it, it is not only always in participating, but it is also in bearing with us that art, uh, you know, uh, art works out its aesthetic. So uh, and so for the same reason, it has to continue. It has to perennially uh, be there, uh, reflecting on these kind of questions because war and love and these kind of issues are have been uh, perennial themes, and they they have their 
kind of, you see it on the ground all the time, you know, from the beginning of civilization. So, uh, but same time, art makes a commentary on this also. It bears witness. It is not just about participating. It is not just about being activists uh, on the ground. You know, there have to be some other modes of uh, continuing to critique, comment upon this, despite. Uh, so it, this has to rise above perhaps the the the, the real on the ground problems to, in order to bear witness. So uh, that way, like the position of Masui uh, being there is also uh, is indicative so of that. Yeah, so you make it an integral part of the concept yeah. because of these situations. So because the the sculpture is meant to be there, and that, because you plan it to be seen from the distance, and you know, kind of. But of course, I would have said the sculptures were really planned for the ground, which was not possible for it. Because it's, it doesn't, uh, I, I, I wish I could make those sculptures which are considered to be on the ground, I suspect. Which is not happening. Maybe one time we'll wait for the right time to come. Yeah, I had a sort of related comment. It's more about the worldview, like the, your main characters, they always seem very joyous and uh, liberated. And I was wondering if your own sort of emotion, like obviously sometimes one is depressed or um, unhappy, so one never sees that sorrow reflected, and I actually love that, but I'm just saying that, you know, when the other, when the smaller characters are there, then you see the kind of anonymity of the, what you're speaking, but you're larger, when you actually see the faces, there's this kind of uh, joy in it always, so how, yeah. you know, I you just uh, yeah, it's true, when, when I get depressed, I make a very joyful start. <laughs> I really do, and that's only being stuff living with that depression. And it's one way of handling it. I mean, you know, if Jesus could do it simply because I don't want to bring, I mean, it's one way of addressing it, one way of facing it, and uh, extremely, you know, it's like when you are very feel weak, you make a Buddha to get some strength. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it's like that when you are sad, probably I'm coming with kind of, like, I mean, Musi's expression is, is, fairly inspiring for hosting all kinds of directions, you know. So that's very encouraging. That gives a lot of different quality of space for me. It does. And then in the process I also hope to be liberating for others. So definitely some of these are results of very, very sad situations. But it's not barely shown, yes. It's not. No, when the wave takes you down, it brings you up. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. What I see in those elevated figures, I think I see a, an acrobat, I see a wind, uh, I see a flame, I see a wave of, or a water splash. So I ne never see, I never thought that it was necessary to bring it down somewhere. And in that entire journey that you have had, uh, I see Radha Krishnan flowing all through, rather than Masui or uh, the, the Lady Maya. And that flow speaks of your growth, your ideas, as if you are a flame, you are smoke, you are something that you can attain any shape. And that's why they attain those shapes which are actually not possible to attain physically. Physically. So I like that freedom and I appreciate that. And I also appreciate the courage to depict it and stand by it. That means people should accept the way it is rather than order me to make a very conformed figure so that it can be. Yeah. That's very great about the entire series. What I also like is that continuity. We are talking of continuity. Uh, your growth from finding a boy who had a wonderful face and the way you try to help him as well by giving him a semi-permanent occupation at your own lab or the department. So that's also very kind of you to, to, to give him something that he, can, he was capable of and you saw that talent in him. And the whole thing actually reflects Radha Krishna and nobody else. I don't see those figures there at all. What do you say about this? I think that's not really the way of looking at it because it's uh, when the, the question is that Musi around. I mean, yeah, and the Musi, the real Musi was, um, you know, I used to keep seeing him when I was working on Musi also. But then uh, after that, you know, um, the, that you take it, you depart from that, you see, and you become one with that character. You become definitely, you know, it becomes, you, 
you don't really you know, give the second of a, someone you know, different from or somebody outside you. It becomes your own, you, know, you become, you identify the character with yourself. Yes. Do you think you could have ever become a dancer or an acrobat or something like that if you had, if you had not entered into uh, this kind of work? <laughs> <laughs> Do you break into a dance sometimes? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I wish I could. <laughs> I wish I could because uh, movements, you, you make your own movements also, you say you have tremendous energy, I'm sure. Yes, I wish. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe, maybe it's on the other way around that I can do that. That's a universal thing. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to digress from the material domain of tonight's discussion, which is bronze, and uh, would like to focus on the idea of embodiment, as we have seen throughout many sculptures uh, where they embody historical figures, deities, and uh, also fictional characters and all. But I think this is one of the least discussed part about your work, which is uh, your influences from the theatrical tradition and performance tradition. And somewhere that also connects with what uh, has been discussed earlier about the artist's responsibility, which is uh, a kind of obscure part, is that your active involvement with the Progressive Theatre and the theatre theater group in Delhi circles and uh, the kind of uh, activist uh, part, which led to the struggles against communal forces and also the kind of uh, left-leaning tradition you come from. And I think that uh, uh, kind of... Uh, which goes into the background, this kind of discourse, which goes into the background, I think it promote, I think it prompts people to discuss or uh, uh, tell or, or, or uh, I think uh, see these works as apolitical, that they are completely isolated. Musui is isolated from the poverty. Musui, uh, like you are only uh, uh, taking Musui's poverty and depicting it. But uh, somewhere this lesser aspect, which has not been this, uh, like talked a lot about, like, uh, one question is, what are the influences? And uh, this was part of a comment about your involvement and all. But if you would like to speak about that, that would also be interesting. Uh, this is like talking about your work, you don't normally speak about what I've seen to on the other side. You know, because there are many things that you're involved in. It. Like, uh, yeah, the time that I came here, we formed this, this alternative theatre group. And we had performances of, you know, con with the kind of um, issues that you have, current issues that you dealt with, and uh, especially after the, you know, these must demolitions and all kinds of issues that you come across and thing, and you had tremendous writers. We get them to write the script, and then we also want we had a. Some of the best directors coming and uh, directing, say, this kind of play. Well, like Sushi Kumar, writers like that, you know, we had. So, uh, you do that, all that kind of things, because that really has a different kind of a reach out to a different kind of a people, because much larger audience. Because sculpting, uh, when it comes to sculpting, I have a, a different way of involving myself, but also in a kind of a collective space. You really deal with. You know, social issues and I have to sing it in a, which will, in a different dimension and it takes you to be in different directions. So those kind of involvements are there and that, that naturally get reflected in your own work, knowingly or unknowingly, but making a sculpting or making more with a kind of a collective activity is a different thing. But I am very much involved in that part also. As a person who's responsible, uh, I was just curious. Um, so, um, how how do you uh, decide at some point of time that a work or design you're making is complete? Uh, and you mentioned you visit sometimes to see if your figures are happy. Uh, are there instances where you've changed them? Also, um, most of the figures appear to be um, really flowy, like in the wind, um, thin hands, and 
I was wondering whether there is any element of inspiration from monkeys, or because they appear to have long, and there's also like I noticed the absence of a button. Uh, also, since you're financing your own sculptures in public spaces, I wanted your opinion on whether you think there's a role for explicitly sad sculptures in public places. All your sculptures, like you said, uh, seem to show happiness, and e even though there might be some sad meaning possibly hidden, but uh, <laughs> uh, why do we uh, like not experiment at all with explicitly sad pieces? This is most of the public sculptures that I have. It's like the last one that you have seen in the Calicut city. And uh, the concept, concept was the time tides. And uh, it's not, Musi is not a witness of the time, but Musi is the time itself. It's not the time, he's not the So you could see some of those, you know, additional stone pieces and seven pieces had some of the, um, you know, uh, some of them really restructured uh, compositions and some of them which are really grounded. So, you know, this elevated, you know, this you see there on the, on the, on the top of the stone, you know, form, is not to express a happiness or anything, not to express the sadness either, but it is something that, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's like came from elsewhere, and sort of came and stood there and to take off. A kind of a, you know, you're taking that momentum, you know. So I'm not telling you that's what I said. It's, it's not really a fitness of the time, but time itself that, that moves, that came with certain memories and get into a kind of a unknown indifferent space. So the expression of Mosi obviously is kind of a smiling face doesn't mean that it's all extremely very happy celebrated, but yes, it's but it has it really does evoke in, when you look at it. Because it's the expression is like you said, the monkey characters. Of course they're so flexible, they're very fluid, very plastic. And the moment they're all very thin figures because movement is one of the prime interest is that. And if it is very big volume, the movement doesn't show. So obviously you have, also you are inspired of all kinds of forms. And I told you that from the traditional like Amravati sculptures, which has a kind of a, you know, exaggerated elongations, the figures that was in the tradition. So all that naturally I really try to incorporate in my own figures so you can see it. Because to focus, to emphasize the movement in different directions, those, those elongated characters, which looks like monkey, or whatever you say, you know, also that helps me to really attain that moment. So they are not really monkeys. <laughs> Just one thing, how do you ensure the stability when you design? Uh, as in, uh, are you already aware when, when you're placing these on high uh, heights that these will, uh, before you make them, not have uh, any sort of movement, that sort of thing? Yeah. Only whether you do it at design time or you measure somewhere later once no, you finish no. it? <laughs> Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, um, I think the answer is that you're working for 40 years and, and you know, you know, that uh, whichever direction it goes, that you can see and it doesn't fall. And uh, the reason is that, you know, it's sort of, many people ask me, actually, you know, do you distribute the weight accordingly of the bronze because set the legs and this, but how can you control the weight part? Because it's, it's also should be having a balancing visually. It's not the weight that balances. It's visual balance. And to attain that, there are techniques, of course. And that comes so so natural to you. Because I don't know whether I need to have any kind of a stress in today to look at you. Because I know that you know on, on this on this it can take so much weight and it can do it because it's it's done like that. So it's like you know some of the some of the sculptures of Dega. You really have the horses or some of the sculptures because we, I, I, don't, I don't start the sculptures from the ground. I make them hanging. You know, like when you, you when the clay modeling is done in space itself. It's, it doesn't have any contact with the ground. So after completion of the sculpture in space, then only I find the, the connection with the ground. 
So it's almost like kind of working in a reverse manner, perhaps. Sometimes. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm coming back to you, Masuri, because uh, now it's a lot, a lot of things have changed. Because uh, I have a small little sculpture that, uh, uh, from the TVB days, yes, yes, yes. and I've always looked at it as a very nice piece and this and that. I'm now desperately wanting to go back home and try to relook the Masuri in it. <laughs> so I'm just uh, still stuck at it. Anyway, I, I just thought those flying things, like what you were saying. Uh, reminds me of puppets <coughs> in a certain way. So, you know, there are some strings which are just not visible. Now, this Mosari chap <coughs> is now haunting me, does it? It started from a very simple basic model and then I don't know what happened in it, in it right? Does, is he a mascot? Is he, does he haunt you? <coughs> or is a part of Radha now Mosari or something has dissolved and there are Pieces. Uh, what exactly is it? I mean, is it? A, I mean, it's it's neither an inspiration. Is it a toy? Is it a tool? Is it a? Uh, is it? Is it? Is it? Is it just a, a piece of thought? Uh, what exactly? Because, I mean, as an architect, because we don't use living things, uh, we use objects, elements, familiarities, symbols, yeah. signs. What is Muslim to you? What? What does it? How does it really? What does it does to me? Yeah, I mean, do you, I mean, it's, is it is it a toy? Is it a mascot? Is it a is it? I mean, does it haunt? Is it a ghost? Is it? A, I don't disagree when somebody says it's an alter ego. I don't disagree. with some kind of, you know, this kind of circumstances, a certain sense of haunting about this, uh, these things that you see. Uh, one more thing with which we can close maybe is uh, because Prem also asked about this, uh, this uh, involvement with other things. If you look at these compositions, uh, like not uh, look at these uh, things as sculptures, but that has many of these uh, uh, sculptures are compositions also. So when you look at these compositions, you see them in various ways, like, you know, they are choreographed pieces. Uh, they are placed uh, in various places, like, you know, by the sea, within uh, nature's location, uh, kind of in the background of music, uh, or of nature, etc., etc. And the characters themselves, they have an impishness, as he mentioned. You know, they are like cartoon characters, like you know, kind of caricaturist uh, nature about them. Uh, and if you uh, notice one of the one of the photographs of those small, tiny figures, you know, they looked actually when I first saw it, uh, it looked like a sketch, a pencil sketch. So uh, there are uh, various ways in which uh, you know this particular site that he is creating is connecting with so many different sites like with dance, performance, uh, with, uh, with graphic kind of representations, other graphic representations, music. Uh, so it is it's theatrical uh, in that kind of, the composition is theatrical. Uh, so uh, yeah, maybe all these things, because he's an artist and he's not an academic, so he doesn't speak about this and like, you know, okay, I have this one, two, three, we are so used to this kind of uh, academic um, exercise that we get so, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, we, we need those kind of, uh, yeah, uh, but, you know, an artist's work different, works differently, so these are all things which are flowing in, and, but then it is for us to understand how this works and what it evokes and what it gives us. As uh, we said, these are perennial kind of uh, expressions bearing with us. Like we have a cultural band called Bearing With Us. So we feel very strongly about this. Like, you know, these things really bear witness to the times, to the problems of the times, to the space. It brings time and space together with a certain kind of urgency of molten bronze, you know, becoming a form, becoming various forms. Thank you very much, Rafa. And thank you very much for Bronze's continuity. It is named Bronze's continuity. This is one of
one of the greatest tributes like Leila has ever got in terms of